Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Edward Byrne, the president and principal of King's College London, and what a delight it is to see so many people here tonight, uh, so many distinguished guests, uh, for this very special occasion. Uh, I want to begin uh, by welcoming His Eminence, uh, who is always a very uh, welcome guest at King's. Uh, wonderful to see you here, Your Eminence. Uh, the Ambassador, uh, uh, the Minister for Culture and Sport of the Hellenic Republic, who I'll welcome more fully in a moment. Um, uh, Your Excellencies, the Ambassadors uh, in both directions of the United Kingdom to Greece and of Greece to the United Kingdom. Uh, welcome, Your Excellencies, uh, and of course, many, many distinguished guests and academic colleagues. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. We are here this evening uh, at King's to join with the Anglo-Hellenic League to celebrate 100 years from the founding of the Correa's Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College London. A very, very special anniversary indeed. The chair came into existence, as we'll hear more fully a little later, through the initiative of a previous principal of King's, the classical scholar and Philhellene Ronald Burroughs, together with the then Prime Minister of Greece, uh, Eleftherios Venizelos, and prominent members of the Greek community in London, with the assistance of the then recently formed Anglo-Hellenic League. We welcome three very distinguished international experts in modern Greek and Byzantine studies, <laughs> Professor De Mavril Cameron, Professor Pascalis Kitramilides, and Professor Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith, who will all speak shortly. They will talk about the history and the future prospects of this prestigious, this incredibly important chair, uh, and of their fields of study, of course, from their own perspective. I would again like to extend a particularly warm welcome to the Minister for Culture and Sport of the Hellenic Republic, Mrs. Lydia Konyudu, and her colleagues from the ministry, that ministry, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who visit us at King's, I believe, for the, for the first time. Welcome, Minister. Minister, your presence, along with the serving ambassadors of Greece to the UK and of the UK to Greece, as well as several of their predecessors, testifies to the historic and continuing importance of the Correa's chair. This goes far beyond the walls of academia to reach out to the wider public space of our respective nations and to help to promote mutual understanding between them. Here I refer not only to Greece, but also to the Republic of Cyprus and indeed the worldwide Hellenic community including, of course, those Londoners and UK nationals of Greek and Greek Cypriot origin. It seems a lot longer, but only four years ago, King's College set out on a journey to ensure the future of the Correz Chair on a new and secure basis. Generous donations from the Greek community in the UK, Greece and Cyprus made during those years have established a partnership between our university and the Greek community that we particularly serve through the ongoing functioning of this chair. And it has been fully funded and is secure for the generations ahead. During the hundred years of the chair's existence, and particularly since the 1970s, King's has committed its resources to establishing modern Greek and Byzantine studies firmly within the academic curriculum of our university, alongside the more traditional study of the ancient Greek world in which our classics department has excelled uh, for many decades. Now, thanks to the generosity of charitable and educational foundations and individuals, several of whom are represented here tonight or are, or are here in person tonight, the university has been able to appoint a distinguished successor to the present Correa's professor. Professor Roderick uh, Roddy Beaton, who has held the post for no less than 30 years, will step down later this summer and be succeeded by Professor Gonda Van Steen who currently holds a chair of Greek studies at the University of Florida in the United States of America. 
It is a great pleasure indeed to, to welcome Professor von Steyn to King's on this wonderful occasion uh, when we not only celebrate the last hundred years but relaunch the Corres Chair into its second century of teaching, research and public engagement in the fields of modern Greek and Byzantine studies. So enough from me, uh, uh, let us enjoy this wonderful evening uh, with a richness of speakers as I hand over to our current Coras Professor, Roddy Beaton, who I hope you will all acknowledge fully uh, uh, after his 30th year of service, who will introduce the other speakers. Roddy. Thank you, Principal. And in turn, I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, packed hall. It's a great uh, tribute. It's a wonderful thing to see so many people, many of you who have been supporters and friends of the Center for Hellenic Studies and the Corais Chair um, for as long as I can remember, and indeed, for even, for in some cases, for even longer. And I've been here for quite a long time. I'm actually here before you now um, to introduce the rest of what is a rather packed as well as star-studied program, but I hope you'll indulge me just for a few moments um, if I take this opportunity to say a few thank yous as I come to the end of a tenure that on the day I leave, as the principal mentioned, will actually have lasted exactly 30 years. Now, 100 years ago, a professor of modern Greek and Byzantine studies was a rare beast, an exotic beast indeed. And even today, um, so far as I can see, there's actually no post anywhere else in the world that is exactly like the Corais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature. It really is quite a mouthful, believe me, if you need to get used to explaining to people what you do for a living. But <clears throat> within, within Kings, today and for many decades past, a Corais professor, exotic or not, hasn't been by any means alone. And it's wonderful that today I have no fewer than four full-time colleagues in permanent academic positions who teach and carry out research in other modern Greek or Byzantine studies in our university. Several more colleagues with fixed-term roles work alongside those at any given time. But what I really wanted to emphasize is that everything that Kings has done in these fields during my time here has been the result of collaborative effort. To colleagues past and present, to their support and their collegiality, I owe an enormous debt. And I also have many generations of students to thank. Because what we call at university teaching, in inverted commas, it's always seemed to me, right from the beginning, it's kind of misnomer because teaching at university is not a one-way process. It's a process of learning for all involved. So I would like to say thank you to all the students from whom I have learned over all my years at King's. Thanks to all of them. For the work that we do in modern Greek and Byzantine studies, support from the college's own institutions has, of course, been absolutely fundamental. King's wouldn't be the leading player worldwide that it is today in the fields covered by the Corais chair had it not been for successive principals, deans, and other senior officers of the college who <clears throat> have been persuaded that the subject merited the commitment that they have been willing, in turn, to give to it. Practical support at a day-to-day -day level has been the lifeblood of all those aspects of our work that reach out beyond academia to engage the wider public. As director of the Center for Hellenic Studies, I have benefited, as I know previous directors did too, from the splendid dedicated work done by the professional services team in our Arts and Humanities Research Institute, some of whom were here this evening, and the college's fundraising and supporter development department. Support for our work from outside the college has been overwhelming and heartening, heartwarming, especially, but indeed not only, in the response to our recent appeal for the re-endowment of the Corais chair that the principal spoke about just now. The institutions and the individuals who have contributed to the re-endowment of the Corais chair are named on the back of the brochure that you have in front of you. 
But I would like to extend my personal thanks to several of their representatives who are <coughs> here tonight. And I begin by mentioning Matty Egon, who sadly is actually not here tonight. Uh, she was prevented at the very last minute from joining us, which is uh, a very great sadness to us all. She had an accident earlier today, um, not a serious one, I'm, I, I understand. I did have the chance to speak to her, but I would like on behalf of us all to wish her a speedy and full uh, recovery. Um, personal thanks to Edme Levendis and Anastasios P. Levendis, uh, the latter also a fellow of King's College, representing the Levendis, the A.G. Levendis Foundation. Charis de Signotti, representing the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Efi Strataki, representing both the Nomikos Foundation and the Vergotis Foundation. And George Lemos, representing the Hellenic Foundation, which is based here in London. And among those not able to be with us, I would additionally like to mention Mr. Yanis Tournaras, Governor of the Bank of Greece, um, who told me, um, and sounded actually genuinely very sad in saying so, that many months ago I asked him would, would he be able to come and even perhaps address us this evening, and he said, what a shame, I have to be at an Ecofin meeting in Sintra. Well, I was able to tell him in return that Lord Byron um, had written uh, had spent a memorable time at Sintra, which he wrote about memorably, and uh, Dr. Studaris was very pleased to be told that. Um, several other people whose names are not recorded played key roles in assisting our appeal, and among those present tonight, I'd like to name successive UK ambassadors to Greece, Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith, John Kitmer, who was in post at the time and gave a great moral boost to our efforts, <clears throat> and the current ambassador, Kate Smith. I must also ask the former ambassador of, must also thank the former ambassador of Greece to the UK, Konstantinos Bikas, and the High Commissioner of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Euripides Evriviadis, who is represented this evening by the cultural councillor, Mr. Achilleas Kazikiriakou. Now, that is enough of looking backwards. Let's turn to the future, beginning with the rest of this evening. The Anglo-Hellenic League and the Katie Lendakis Award will be introduced by the League's chairman, John Kitmer. John, as has already been mentioned, served as UK ambassador to Greece from 2013 to 2016. He is also, by a rather unusual coincidence, of which we at King's are rather proud, completing a PhD in our Department of Classics on the poetry of Yanis Ritsos, working under the direction of my colleague, Professor David Ricks. After the presentation of the Lendakis Award, the rest of the evening will run without interruption. So let me say a few words of introduction now. Pascalis Kitrumilidis is Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the University of Athens. His book, Enlightenment and Revolution, The Making of Modern Greece, published in 2013, is a summation of a lifetime of scholarship on the history of ideas in Greek from the end of the Byzantine Empire to the 19th century. Professor Kitrubili, this is quite literally and truly the leading authority in the world on the work of Adamandios Koreis and has just published a new critical edition of the commentary that Korais wrote on the first provisional constitution of independent Greece, uh, which was promulgated in, uh, on the, the 1st of January, 1822. Professor Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith is a historian and former diplomat who served as UK ambassador to Greece from 1996 to 1999. He is also, and has been for a good many years now, a visiting professor in our Center for Hellenic Studies. Sir Michael's book, Ionian Vision, Greece in Asia Minor, 1919 to 1922, <clears throat> was first published in 1973 and revised in 1998. This remains the most authoritative, authoritative historical study of an episode in Greek history <clears throat> that spans the inauguration and first operation of the Korais chair a century ago. Sir so Michael is now completing a full-length uh, biography of the Greek Prime Minister and statesman who was among the first public figures to support 
the founding of the Corais chair, namely Eleutherios Venizelos. Professor Dame Averill Cameron was until recently warden of Keble College, Oxford. Before that, she held a chair in ancient history at King's, and from 1988 to, 1980, to 1994, the chair of late antique and Byzantine studies, also at, here at King's. Averill was the founding director of our Centre for Hellenic Studies, and I can tell you she set the bar extremely high for all of her now quite numerous successors. Averill Cameron has published many books, some addressed to academic specialists, others a wider readership, focusing particularly on the long period of transition from the end of the Roman Empire to the Middle Ages that now, and partly thanks to Averill's work, we specialists are accustomed to calling late antiquity. She's also published on the thousand year empire of Byzantium. And among her recent, her recent books is Byzantine Matters of 2014, which I understand has just been published in a Greek translation. That's a title that points straight towards, I think, the heart of what she'll be talking about shortly. After the three presentations, we're especially pleased to have with us Professor Juan de Van Steen, who in September will become the next Corais professor of all that which I won't repeat now, but she will learn it if she hasn't already. Gonda is still in post in Florida, but she's come all this way to be with us this evening, and she will give the vote of thanks. As you can read more fully in the program, Gonda is already the author of four books and is now working on an exciting and unusual project about the adoption of Greek children in the aftermath of the civil war in Greece in the 1940s. Gonda, I'd like to join with the principal in welcoming you and Greg most warmly to London and to King's. And to you, Gonda, I wish every possible success as you set the Corais chair on course for its next hundred years. Finally, but by no means least, it's a huge privilege to have with us the Minister for Culture and Sport of the Hellenic Republic, Mrs. Lydia Conyordu, who has kindly agreed to make the closing remarks. I'll say no more for now, as the Minister will be introduced by the Ambassador of the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Dimitrios Karamitsos Tsiras. So now, and I have spoken for slightly longer than I said I would, now forward to the future, the next century of the Corais Chair begins right here. John, you're on next. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a huge pleasure. It may be formulaic to say so, but it's a huge pleasure uh, to be here uh, this evening. Um, many of us here tonight have been uh, looking forward to uh, this centenary event for a number of years and uh, in various different ways preparing for it. Um, but of course, as Roddy has already told us, it isn't really a centenary event, it's a bicentenary event. Although we may be here primarily to celebrate the first 100 years of the Korais chair, thanks to the magnificent success of the campaign um, that has run for uh, the past four years, we are now confidently facing the next 100 years uh, of the Korais chair. So I will address my remarks a little bit to the past, but also to the future. For those of you who don't know us, the Anglo-Hellenic League, uh, we are a charity dedicated to promoting understanding and friendship between Britons and Greeks through charitable and cultural work. We began our activities just a little bit before the Corais Chair in 1913 with the aims both of promoting the Greek cause in the UK and also of raising funds for the relief of Greek refugees, uh, those who had been displaced by the Balkan Wars. The two main figures in the League's foundation were William Pember Reeves, director of the London School of Economics, that place some of you may know about over the road, uh, and Ronald Burroughs, the principal of this university. 
In the course of time, Burroughs, uh, as our current principal has said, became the leading light in the foundation also of the Corais chair here at King's. From the start, the League had the support and active involvement of the Greek business community here in London. The famous names, Ioannidis, Mavrogordato, Rally, and Casavetti, and of Greece's senior diplomat, its highly influential minister, Ioannis Yanadios. It was inevitable then that the League would play its own role in supporting the endowment of the proposed chair. The League raised in excess of 11,000 pounds at the time. We can calculate this in different ways, but it's probably about 600,000 pounds today, not least through its very good contacts with Helena Skilitsi, who would later become Eleftherios Venizelos' second wife. Through the Korais chair, the League and Kings have always enjoyed the closest of relationships. Two members of the Center for Hellenic Studies here at King's are current members of the Council of the League, Professor Beaton uh, and Professor Sir Michael Thuellen Smith, who will address us later. The League is proud of the role that successive occupants of the Korais chair have played in furthering an understanding of Greece from Byzantium to the present day. It would be natural to view this role in terms of the formidable contributions to scholarship and to teaching that successive Korais professors have made. And of course, no one here would doubt those contributions. But the Korais chair itself has always meant more than scholarship and teaching alone. The foundation of the chair was a recognition of the role that education and culture have to play in bringing two nations and two peoples together. In the aftermath of the Balkan Wars and during the Great War itself, the women and men who believed that Greece and Britain shared a common path, a common destiny, looked to education and culture as essential tools for forging that shared understanding and commonality of interest, a sort of soft diplomacy ahead of its time. A hundred years on, we're right to ask whether that vision is still pertinent, is still correct. I strongly believe it is. In the next few months, this country, it appears, will leave one of the umbrella alliances that have, for most of my lifetime, shaped and defined relations across Europe and between the member states of the European Union itself. Although Britain's relations with the European Union will continue, I'm sure, to be handled primarily in Brussels, it's arguable that our bilateral relations with the 27 member states of the Union will now become increasingly important across many different sectors of activity. It's not just our diplomats who will have to rethink their game, our businesses, our outward investors, our students, our citizens will all be operating within a changed environment. It seems highly likely to me that in the future we will need more Brits who have acquired a deep and reliable knowledge of at least one of the European Union member states. More Brits, in other words, who know Greece, not just for its crystalline seas, its perfect beaches, and its pulsating nightlife, important though all those things are, but also for its astonishing language, its unsurpassed literature, and its very long history, a history which, with which for over 200 years and more, Britain has been deeply involved. And some of us here are hoping, I'm sure, that at some point in the near future, because of these changes, an enlightened government might take action to reverse the collapse in the learning of European languages in our education system, modern Greek included. To be successful in Europe in the future, we Brits are going to have to try harder. The Korais chair, in other words, is no less needed in 2018 than it was in 1918, and the League, as a founding party and friend, will continue to have very high expectations of the chair and to wish its occupants every success. For the past 30 years, those expectations have been more than abundantly met by the chair's outgoing holder, Professor Roddy Beaton. Roddy's contributions to scholarship, 
the excellence of his teaching, on which I have direct and continuing experience, and his dynamic presence as a force for the promotion of Hellenic studies have proved second to none. In the events that were held during my time as ambassador in Athens, it was very clear that Roddy has star quality in Greece. It may have been surprising to open the morning Greek newspaper and find as a headline Roddy's pronouncement that Lord Byron, if alive today, would have been mnemoniakos, that is, in favor of the memoranda with the international creditors, but it was impossible to, to doubt how superbly Roddy had thus captured the attention of the media and through them the public in the brilliant presentation of his deep scholarship and the important point he was making. The Korais chair should be occupied by a public intellectual and for the past 30 years it certainly has been. I know that I can speak on behalf of all the League in thanking and congratulating Roddy for all he has achieved and in welcoming his successor Gonda van Steen to the chair. In closing, I have a very nice task, another very nice task to perform, a task that shows again how closely entwined are the Anglo-Hellenic League and King's College. Since 2002, the League has given an annual prize in honor of Katie Lendakis, who played an admirable role in the Greek resistance, who became uh, an active member of the Greek community here in London and who for many years was a vice chair of the Anglo-Hellenic League itself. The prize in her honor is given to a final year undergraduate in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at King's for an essay on a topic related to any field of Hellenic studies. This year, three students have been shortlisted for the award. You'll find uh, their names and their supervisors in uh, the paperwork you have. Um, but I will list the students themselves in alphabetical order. Felicity Beach for an essay entitled Euripides' New Helen and Homer. Nicholas Christensen for an essay called Spartan Educational Ideals in the Prussian Cadet Corps of the 19th Century. And Harry Tanner for an essay entitled The Meaning of Thalas, a Scientific Approach. Now, the decisions about the award are made by the, the Center for Hellenic Studies itself. But I, uh, this afternoon, took some time out to read the winning essay. I have to say it is really impressive. So, I'm pleased to announce that for an essay which elegantly and tautly, with science and with flair, examines the meanings of the word thalas, the winner of the Katie Lendakis Memorial Fund Award 2018 is Harry Tanner. Now Harry, or Thalas, and he would know, he would know because he wrote about it, that by this I mean a sense of absence and loss, uh, Harry can't be with us today, so let me invite his stepfather, who's his representative, to collect the award on his behalf. I hope someone will come forward. <laughs> And let me now invite um, Felicity Beach and Nicholas Christensen to come and collect their com commendations. I stand in the middle, and you... That's it. Good smile. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Adamantios Korais, whose name, with good reason, was selected one century ago as the most appropriate denomination of the chair meant to make known in the English-speaking world 
the main components of the later Greek intellectual tradition, was at the time primarily recognized as a classical scholar and editor of major sources of ancient Greek literature from Homer to Plutarch and Marcus Aurelius. Between the years 1799-1800 and the year of his death, 1833, he produced 29 volumes of editions of Greek texts with extensive prolegomena, some with French translations as well. This imposing scholarly output makes him an eminent representative of the transmission of the classics and has recently gained him a rightful place in the dictionary of the classical tradition. If Koraisa's eminence as a classical scholar was mostly 19th century achievement, the 20th century added a second reputation to his record, that of one of the prophets of nationalism. This was mainly due to his role in the Greek movement of independence and his contribution both as a spokesman for the rights of the Greek nation in the age of revolutions and as a theoretical protagonist in the definition of the modern Greek nation on the basis of its language and its cultural affinity with classical Greece. Koraisa's inclusion among the prophets of 19th century European nationalism was the work of the most eminent among the founders of the study of nationalism in the 20th century, including Arnold Toynbee, the first holder of the Koraiz chair, Carlton Hayes, Hans Kohn, and R. R. Palmer, the older scholars in the audience would recognize those names. Perhaps they don't mean much to the younger generations. But they were very important scholars when I was being trained in these subjects. The canonization of his political thought as national thought, however, was mostly the result of the discovery and translation from the French of one of his most important theoretical writings, the 1803 essay on the condition of civilization in Greece by Eli Keduri, up the road at uh, LSE, as uh, we just heard, in 1970. Eli Keduri, one of the most perceptive critical scholars of nationalism, established Korais as a major, indeed the earliest, representative of the process of cultural transmission that transferred Western thought to non-Western contexts thus initiating the incubation of nationalist movements as assertions of modernity beyond the Western core of the modern world. In other words, one could say that Keduri established Korais as one of the pioneers of what is now called globalization of Western culture, outlooks, and values. This may have gained a more or less permanent presence for Korais in the field of nationalism studies, but it involved, nevertheless, a serious moral and intellectual cost. Understanding his political thought as simply a variety of nationalist doctrine, in fact, means considerable reductionism and even impoverishment. This has been the case, almost as a general rule, not with Keduri's own writing, but with all subsequent ritual references in writings on nationalism to Keduri's reading of Korais. What I should like to do tonight in this, on this occasion is to try to rectify this imbalance by placing Korais's understanding of the nation and its rights in the broader framework of his reflection on the character and meaning of a free society. This broader framework encompasses Koraisa's theory of individual rights and civil liberties, a theory that forms an indivisible continuum with his national doctrine, the argument for freedom and independence of the national community. Koraisa expresses his political views and puts forward, occasionally forcefully, arguments in support of his liberal democratic vision repeatedly in the long prolegomena he prefixed in his editions of Asian classics and in many pamphlets he published in response to critical issues and circumstances in the course of the Greek war 
and movement of independence. All these texts make up an imposing corpus of political reflection, which could rightfully claim a recognizable place in the canon of modern political thought if modern Greek had a wider leadership in the community of scholars. Among Koraïs's political writings, perhaps the most articulate and significant is a little-known text, and even a text which is even less used, in which he outlines at length and in considerable detail his vision of how a free society should be shaped in the independent Greek state under construction amidst the struggles of liberation in the 1820s. This literally seminal source among his political writings, which can be dated with considerable certainty to the year 1823, had remained unpublished in Koraïs's own lifetime and it disappeared after his death. It was almost definitively lost after the disappearance in the late 19th century of the only manuscript witness that transmitted it, Koraïs's own autograph copy. It was rescued from oblivion almost miraculously, thanks to the paleographic curiosity and republican zeal of a now forgotten scholar whom it's good to remember tonight, Themistocles Volidis, curator of the manuscripts of the National Library of Greece in the early 20th century. Volidis managed to discover the text in the form of the typographical proofs of an aborted edition of Koraïs's unpublished writings, but not the original manuscript. From the proofs, he made the only edition of the work in 1933, exactly 100 years after Koraïs's death. And you have just heard that the second edition is just off the press at the moment. The text in question is Koraïs's notes on the provisional constitu constitution of Greece, Simiosis is to prosorinon politevma tis Elados. This was an article by article commentary on the first constitution voted on the 1st of January 1822 by the first National Assembly of Revolutionary Greece at the Bidoros. The same constitutional document in its French translation also elicited Jeremy Bentham's detailed commentary at about the same time. This is a good pointer at the interest generated by the experiment of state building and constitution making in revolutionary Greece in European political thought at the time under the conditions of repression in Restoration Europe. In his commentary, Koraïs voices systematically his concern with the prospects of constructing a viable liberal democratic polity in the liberated country, a liberal polity that might rekindle the hopes of the oppressed everywhere in Restoration Europe. Hence, the interest provoked by Greece's provisional, provisional constitution in the rest of Europe and also in North America through many translations, two or three in English, one in French, one in German, and other European languages. The main constituents of his vision of a free society take the form of specific suggestions, stipulations, and principles designed to guide the construction of the new constitutional order to be established in Greece. They refer primarily to the following main issues as to the building and organization of the new state. First, at the top of Koraïs's theoretical agenda appears the question of the relation of religion and politics. He is categorical on the separation of church and state, complete freedom of all religious doctrines and forms of worship, and strict limitation of religion in the private sphere of the life of the citizens in the new state. He insists that in a well-ordered society, religion should be kept apart from secular power, and clergymen should be excluded from public office. What is completely remarkable in this early contribution to liberal religious thought is Koraïs's insistence on unprejudiced treatment and recognition of non-Christian non religions in the new state, 
Judaism and Islam on an equal footing with Christianity. Secondly, concerning the structure of the state, Koraiz insists that the separation of powers introduced by the provisional constitution should be revised to bring about more effective control of the executive branch by the legislature. His mistrust of the bearers of exec executive power brings, brings him on this issue very close to the relevant arguments enunciated by Jeremy Bentham repeatedly in his arguments in this period of the clamoring of reform in Britain. He also points to the need of decentralization in order to make local government both a strong bulwark against the inner tendency of executive power to expand and also an effective context of self-management for local communities which take over the functions of security, education, and religious life. Decentralization should also mark the administration of justice with the institution of justices of peace who would be elected locally. The most important component of decentralization concern the armed forces of the state. Regular standing armies are unnecessary and can be dangerous, Gorais warns. National defense should be entrusted to local militias composed of citizens. And specifically, he says, all citizens are soldiers in the service of the motherland. This is a declaration which very vividly recalls the long tradition of European radicalism going back to the civic humanism of the Renaissance. His proximity to Bentham's thought is also reflected in his views on public administration. Here, the main principle should be the minimization of expenses, recalling Bentham's official aptitude maximize, official expense minimized. In this spirit, Corais also develops his categorical rejection of the establishment of a monarchical form of government in liberated Greece. Monarchy is rejected in principle because it is based on the idea of inequality, but also it is rejected as unnecessarily expensive. The argument is extended to cover all the traditional supports of monarchical government, a hereditary aristocracy, hereditary public offices, uniforms, decorations, and all other forms and symbols of social hierarchy. And that was the major reason why this text remained unpublished and was almost lost, because at times of the strengthening of royalist feeling in Greece in the second half of the 19th century, and again after the restoration of the monarchy in 1935 following the publication of this text in 1933, this text disappeared from the public eye. Gorais puts forward interesting observations on representation in theory and in practice. This is the third element of his constitutional theory. Representative government provides the basis of legitimacy both to the exercise of power and to the imposition of taxation. The principle no taxation without representation is repeated with particular emphasis by Corais. He is particularly concerned with the complete freedom of the deliberations of the representatives of the nation and the smooth and unimpeded operation of the legislative institutions. He supports the grant of compensation to representatives to make them independent and argues in favor of secret voting in parliament in order to secure the freedom exercise of their judgment. He insists at the same time on complete publicity of deliberations in the legislative body as a guarantee of respect of law and of the freedom of the citizens. In his understanding of representation, Corais adopts a Burkean approach to the role of the representative. In his judgment, the proper exercise of the duties of representation should be detached from the service of local and sectional interests and should be guided by a broader view of the interests of the national community as a whole. Thus, for Corais, the representative, 
to be true to his mission, should think and act as a national statesman and pedagogue, not as a servant of particular interests. Fourthly, Koraïs's primary concern in his commentary was the safeguard of individual rights and civil liberties in the new state. He talks extensively of freedom of conscience, and in this connection he makes important points on the respect of the equality of religious identities. He takes special care to express his concern for the rectification in the new state of injustice and and prejudices of long standing in European societies at the expense of Jewish citizens. The foundation of the doctrine of rights and liberties should be the principle of equality. Equality before the law and the basic rights of personal security, personal liberty and property should be secured for all citizens. The tone of Koraïs's commentary points to his preference for what subsequent political theory in the 20th century would call negative liberty. But he introduces one important exception. For a society of rights and liberties to work, an educated citizenry is absolutely necessary. Socrates expects the new state to adopt a more proactive policy in support of public education and he especially criticizes the provisional constitution for not providing for a minister of education among the top bearers of executive power. He points out in considerable detail the desirable organization of the educational system and the content of its instruction at the elementary level which should be obligatory for all children in the country. Furthermore, concerning secondary schools, he insists that they should be schools of classical education, teaching systematically the Greek and Latin classics, especially texts and authors, whereby a strong sense of morality and the belief in freedom might be cultivated. These are good reminders in contemporary debates in education in Greece, but also elsewhere in Europe, I think. Fifth, Koraïs' unconditional espousal of the principles of European liberalism transpires clearly in his comments on economic issues. He adopts the theory of property from the classic statements of social contract theory. And on this co concept, he builds his full endorsement of a free economy as the basis of a free society. His economic liberalism derives from the economic doctrine of the French physiocrats rather than from his contemporary Scottish political economy. And thus, in his judgment, agriculture rather than commerce should be the economic basis of a well-ordered liberal society. He is categorical in rejecting all forms of economic protectionism and mercantilism, monopolies and close vocational privileges. When commenting on the dis on what he describes as the necessary evil of taxation, he points out that direct taxes should be limited to the minimum absolutely necessary to cover the unavoidable costs of national defense and public order in the state. For those who know Korais as a classical scholar, an editor of classical texts, his extensive awareness of economic issues and debates may come as a surprise. This too is an important element in his makeup as an important social and political theorist, both in his commentary on the provisional constitution and in, and in his voluminous correspondence, he appears aware and ready to converse, not only with the major political thinkers of the liberal tradition like Montesquieu and Bentham, but also with the founding fathers of political economy, primarily the physiocrats, but also Jean-Charles Sismondi and Jean-Baptiste Say among the French, and further with Adam Smith and Thomas Malthus, whose work he knew from their French translations. Corais was not naive. He was a serious and shrewd observer 
of the Greek political scene. He was deeply worried about the prospects of freedom and, the, and of the rule of law in free Greece, as the writings of the last years of his life amply testify. He placed his hopes on three preconditions that might make his vision of a free society a viable prospect for Greece. The first precondition was an enlightened leadership, which for him meant a highly educated political class that ought to be trained, as he puts it, in the political sciences, meaning the Greek and Latin classics of political philosophy. This is political science for him. The second precondition of freedom was the widespread education of the mass of the population, including girls, to make them alert to the duties of citizenship. Finally, the third precondition was freedom of printing and a free press as an agency of critical watch over the bearers of powers, who he, to the end he, he regards with deep mistrust and suspicion. These were the hopes of the Enlightenment, and Korais saw the prospects of freedom in Greek society in exactly these terms. The vigor and intensity which marked the articulation of his vision of freedom through his constitutional commentary suggest that the claims of national self-determination and independence were, in his view, morally justified primarily on account of the eventual contribution independent statehood could make to the achievement and security of the liberties of the individual members of the national community. So national independence was morally justified because it better secured the freedom of the individual. The rest, of course, was and remains history. And history could turn out to be quite different from the noble hopes and ethical imperatives of the Enlightenment which Gorais attempted to teach to his compatriots. For this reason, perhaps, his political thought as a reminder of these imperatives remains relevant and timely to this day. Thank you very much. During Pascalis Kitromilidis' talk, I couldn't help thinking about the continuities and discontinuities between his vision and what actually happened and is still happening. Uh, and that is food for thought for all of us, I think. Uh, some of the continuities uh, do apply to the person that I'm going to be talking about, which is uh, Eleferios Venizelos but also some of the discontinuities. Venizelos was prime minister of Greece at the time of the establishment of the Korais chair, but he wasn't the prime mover that, as we've heard, was Ronald Burroughs, the principal of King's College London. However, Venizelos was involved, and his involvement was important because he had immense prestige in Britain at the critical time. His support guaranteed that the Greek community of London would fall in behind the idea of the chair. And sure enough, the names of Greeks are prominent in the list of donors. Venizelos' contribution to the chair was not merely symbolic. It reflected the course that he embarked on back in 1912 of creating the closest possible understanding between Britain and Greece. He achieved this, and on his visits to London in 1917 and 1918, he was praised in almost extravagant terms, for example, at the Mansion House by Arthur Balfour and Winston Churchill. Why? Well, because they recognized that he had had to struggle to bring Greece into the war on the side of the Entente and that the Greek armed forces had made a significant contribution to the Allies' victory over Germany and Bulgaria. The record of Venizelos' involvement with the chair 
begins with a letter dated the 20th of February 1915 from the distinguished economist and banker Andriadis to Ronald Burroughs. This letter stated that Prime Minister Venizelos was ready to pledge or donate the sum of 300 pounds for the establishment of a chair of modern Greek history and literature. 300 pounds is, I think, about 12,000 pounds in today's money. Andriadis was going to consult a mysteriously designated M on his way through Rome. This M was not the head of the Secret Service, but the independent scholar and journalist William Miller, the author of The Latins in the Levant and Greek Life in Town and Country and many other works, the latter an excellent book, incidentally. My thanks to Matty Egon, who unfortunately is not with us tonight, who showed me the original of the Andriadis letter. There followed the various steps that led to the establishment of the chair, the energetic promotion of the idea by Burroughs, a strong proponent of area studies in Britain, the involvement of the great and the good of the Greek community in London, the consideration of Miller himself, who was clearly the favored candidate of Burroughs and of other candidates. This story has been authoritatively told by Richard Clogg in his book, Politics and the Academy, to which I and others are indebted. And my account today, part of my account, is a precy of a complicated and fascinating story. The Venizelos connection was indirectly furthered by the interest shown by Miss Helena Skilitsi. Helena Skilitsi was a member of a rich Anglo-Greek family with its origin far back in time in Constantinople and more recently in Chios and London. She was already a hero worshiper of Venizelos and was to marry him in 1921 after he fell from power in Greece. She made a large donation to the fund set up by Burroughs to endow the new chair. Once Burroughs had secured the necessary funds, he continued his search for the right candidate. Miller turned the position down. He saw himself as someone who would not be at home in an English academic environment. And in any case, he had ruled out taking the post if the Greek government was the source of funds or a source of funds. And in that, maybe he showed a certain prescience. In the end, two men were interviewed. Arnold Toynbee, a young scholar at the time with a particular interest in contemporary Greece, and as it turned out, in Turkey also, and the historian of ancient Greece, A.W. Gom. As we all know, Toynbee got the job, and it ended badly in a row involving the Greek trustees of the chair as a result of Toynbee's reporting of the Greek war in Asia Minor. He was seen by the trustees as having abused his position by taking the Turkish side in his analysis of the war for the Manchester Guardian. His analysis was a serious one, as can be appreciated by anyone who reads his book, The Western Question in Greece and Turkey. But in a life and death struggle between Greece and Turkey at that time, the Greek donors were not looking for the objectivity from the Korai's professor that Toynbee thought he was providing. Venizelos himself attended Toynbee's inaugural here at King's College on the 7th of October 1919. And in fact, he suggested that the lecture should be published. Ioannis Yanadios, who chaired the meeting and spoke for, frankly, too long, attributed to Venizelos the prime responsibility for the establishment of the chair. He said that Venizelos had raised Greece from ignominy to honor. Certainly, Venizelos' attendance reflected the uniquely close relationship between Britain and Greece at this time. And by extension, the Korais chair did the same. 
These derive from the personality and politics of Venizelos and can be traced back to the first Balkan war in late 1912. At the end of that war in which the Balkan allies, including Greece, defeated the Ottoman Empire and Greece took on what is quite close to being its present dimensions, the Foreign Secretary, Edward Gray, offered London as the host of the peace conference. David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, encouraged Venizelos to come to London where he said the big decisions affecting Greece would be made. Venizelos took up this suggestion and found himself plunged into complicated negotiations on territory, frontiers, and trade-offs. He also made two friends, Lloyd George, who was intensely interested in the fate of Greece, and Churchill, the first Lord of the Admiralty, who had a more direct interest in Greece's potential value as a maritime ally of Britain at a time when war clouds were already gathering. Venizelos' talks with these two giants brought to the surface the possibility of an entente between Greece and Britain, based for Britain on the prospect of naval support from Greece and for Greece on the advantage of having the patronage of the greatest maritime power of the day. And thus was inaugurated this extraordinary period of close partnership and alliance between Britain and Greece. It lasted from 1913 until 1923. And it was the soil in which the cultural and intellectual partnership represented by the Korais chair was able to flourish. Literature, scholarship, the arts were all important to Venizelos. He was creatively occupied with Greek education and the Greek language throughout his career. In fact, I was reflecting that it's in the question of language that he refers directly to Korais and the influence of Korais. In 1911, early in his time as Prime Minister, he steered through Parliament a revision of the Constitution that incorporated for the first time a clause about the Greek language, the official Greek language. And he was bitterly criticized by some of his natural supporters for doing this because they thought it was a betrayal of his own belief in the demotic language. But he showed where his heart lay by supporting liberal and pro-demotic policies in education and publishing the first school primers written in demotic Greek. I'm sure he welcomed the Greek language part of the title of the Korais chair. Language was dear to him, history also, as his library of books in Kanya bears witness, and the arts in general. He liked the company of writers and artists. He was a prodigious reader. He loved the theater, and uh, he would certainly have read with interest Kwanda van Steen's uh, work on the production of ancient Greek drama in the modern world. So it was not accidental that Burroughs pressed for a chair in modern and Byzantine Greek studies at this time when the Prime Minister of Greece was a lover of language, literature, and history, and a man committed to friendship with Britain. Burroughs' interest, as I mentioned, was wider than this. It extended to other regional chairs, which he helped to set up. But Greece held a special place for him. He was an enthusiastic supporter of Venizelos personally. He wrote movingly to Venizelos a week before his death about the prospects for Greece under his leadership. So was Burroughs right to invest so much in this Greek Prime Minister? Yes, I think he was. And I don't believe that the fuss over Toynbee and the chair affects that judgment. Burroughs seized the opportunity thrown up by Venizelos' political sway. No one could have predicted the difficulties that the chair would go through in its early years. The fact is that it weathered the storm so that we can today celebrate its 100th anniversary after a successful tenure by Professor Beaton. 
and we can look forward to its continuation under the professor-elect Rhonda van Steen. This is a tribute not only to the generosity of the sponsors of the new endowment, the Levendis Foundation, the Niarchos Foundation, the Schilitzi Foundation, and all the other donors, collective and individual, but also to the enterprise of Ronald Burroughs and those who contributed to the establishment of the Korais Chair 100 years ago. Thank you. Good evening. To judge from Richard Clogg's account of the foundation of the chair, the word Byzantine in that long title came in at rather a late stage, and it's not very clear uh, where the initiative originated. Corries himself, after whom the chair was named, was famously hostile to Byzantine. And Venizelos seems to have been more interested in classical Greece. Nevertheless, with the foundation of the new chair, it was agreed that there would be a new department of Byzantine and modern Greek studies. On the first selection committee for the chair was John Bagnall Bury, the Cambridge supervisor of Stephen Runciman, a remarkable scholar who wrote histories of both classical Greece and Byzantium. Despite that, he also held two chairs of modern history in succession at Trinity College Dublin, where he was simultaneously professor of Greek and Cambridge. Disciplinary boundaries did not exist then in the way they do now. Bury was interested in Byzantium, or as he called it, the Eastern Roman Empire, despite, not because of, its association with orthodoxy. He was a rationalist who also wrote on scientific history on the idea of progress and the history of freedom of thought. He also produced a magisterial edition of Gibbon's Decline and Fall. And just as Gibbon continued his history of the decline and fall of Rome through the Byzantine period, Bury also found it completely natural to move between the history of classical Greece and Byzantium and the modern period. None of this had anything to do with ideas of Hellenic continuity in the sense in which it was argued in the 19th century debates in Greece. Bury did not confine himself to Greek history, and the idea of Byzantium as a continuation of classical Greece is more likely, is rejected by most Byzantine historians today. They're more likely to claim that it was Roman to the end. It's natural to think that the history of Byzantium started with the foundation of Constantinople by the Emperor Constantine. But many now see the 7th century AD as its real beginning, not because of Slav invasions, but also after the huge loss of territory that resulted from the Arab conquests, when it was remarkable that Byzantium survived at all. Signs of continuity during the long history of Byzantium and indeed the claims made by the Byzantines themselves can be very deceptive when its real history was one of change, tension, and usurpation. Whatever may have been in the mind of Ronald Burroughs and the many others involved in the founding of the Curry East Chair, the chronological and disciplinary range of topics from classical to modern covered at King's College today is truly astonishing in its breadth and also in its willingness to challenge accepted views, and that is the true mark of scholarship. Why then does Byzantium matter? On one level, because it's so often simply ignored in Western European history writing, both academic and popular. An excellent recent book by Neville Morley, classicist, Why Classics Matters, still traces the influence of classics through the rediscovery of Greek and Greek manuscripts in the Italian Renaissance, 
with only a passing reference to the ongoing Roman Empire in the East, quote. We know, in contrast, that Byzantium didn't need a Renaissance because the classics had never been forgotten. Another book published by a respected historian only a few years ago included Byzantium among a list of vanished kingdoms with some rather strange uh, comparators. In 2008, I wrote an article about this invisibility with the title, The Absence of Byzantium, which evoked a whole series of responses over the next year or so and evidently struck a chord, especially when it was published in Greece. Attitudes to Byzantium are, in Britain are very different from those in Greece or other Orthodox countries. Not only are we the inheritors of Edward Gibbon and of Enlightenment disdain, and I look at Pascalis Ketramelidis sitting there now, most of us here have been brought up with a narrative of progress based exclusively on the history of Western Europe. Yeats's Byzantium poems also have something to do with it with their evocation of an imagined Byzantium, all gold, glitter, and exoticism. Conversely, the idea of Byzantium often stands for obscurity and pointless bureaucracy. We Byzantinists are used to this. For English speakers, the term Byzantine says it all. As Judith Herring says at the beginning of her book, The Surprising Life of a Medieval Empire, telling anyone that one is a Byzantinist usually produces a puzzled stare, if not actual incredulity. And I identify with that. As is well known, some earlier holders of the Curry's chair who were Byzantinists also shared this low opinion of Byzantium, either in comparison with classical Greece or simply per se, notably Romilly Jenkins, who was an honorary lecturer in classical archeology span while holding the Curry's chair, but also in some ways Cyril Mango, a great Byzantine scholar, and even Donald Nicol, despite his long service and his many books on Byzantium. Most came from a background in classics, and their attitudes reflected the dominance of traditional classics in English education. This has now been completely transformed. When I joined it in 1965, more years ago than I'd like to <laughs> calculate. The classics department at King's College was very small. Its teaching was based on Greek and Latin language and literature. Even ancient history played a minimal role and classical archeology span was entirely absent. Now, in total contrast, it's one of the largest classics departments in the country, perhaps the largest and its coverage ranges from early Greece to the end of Byzantium and the modern period. 30 years ago, when Roddy Beaton was appointed, Byzantium was very far from its concerns. Now, it's a key component in a teaching and research program that extends to modern Greece. For most of its history, the Curry's chair was seen as largely a research position with no undergraduate or other teaching. Undergraduate courses in Byzantine studies only began with Roddy Beaton's tenure of the chair from 1988. Nowadays, no one who's been to the annual Byzantine Symposia in the UK or seen the number of younger scholars who come to them could doubt their appetite for the subject. It's hugely to the credit of King's College that Byzantine studies flourishes here today and is taught at all levels, introducing Byzantium to new students and new audiences. So Byzantium matters at King's College, but why else does Byzantium matter? Several answers can be given. One is that it's an essential part of the history of Europe. The narrative that traces a line straight from classical antiquity to modernity through the medieval West is manifestly inadequate, especially so at present, with the rise of Putin's Russia, the revival of orthodoxy as a historical force, and the transformation of Eastern Europe and the Balkans since the 1990s. Eurocentrism, this focus on Western Europe, ignores the East and the Islamic world, 
and it also ignores Byzantium. Byzantium also looked east. It engaged with the Islamic world, of course, in military terms, but also in terms of contacts, diplomacy, and interaction. Byzantium made a recovery in eastern Anatolia in the 10th century and regained territory lost earlier. It was actively involved in the Crusades and in Jerusalem and the Holy Land before that. In the 11th century, the Church of the Holy Apostles, I'm sorry, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem was restored from Byzantium under the Emperor Constantine IX Monomachos. A 12th century mission from Constantinople seeking union with the Armenian Catholicos Nurses IV, then based on the Euphrates in what is Eastern Turkey today, carried with it mountains of Greek theological manuscripts all the way across Anatolia as the authorities on which to base its arguments. And with Byzantine success in regaining territory came population transfers with Muslim populations coming under Byzantine control. The late Byzantine world was one of fragmentation and enforced relations with new players on the Mediterranean stage. But migration and cultural and religious transfers were part of Byzantine's Eastern history too. Many historians now are exploring the idea of global history and Byzantium features here too. Instead of the narrowly political and military narratives of standard histories, instead of the older preoccupation with a society that we know was destined to end in 1453, this is a Byzantine history that lifts Byzantium onto another plane altogether. It takes its place in the mosaic of empires extending from Europe across Eurasia to China as a society comparable on every level with the grandest of them and able to maintain itself for centuries. Filling a chair with the scope of the Curry's chair, embracing Byzantine and modern Greek and history as well as language and literature is no easy matter. In today's world of specialization, this is perhaps even more true than it was at the time of the original foundation. But history is also more connected than it ever was. I like to think that in its nearly 30 years of existence, the Center for Hellenic Studies has stood above all for this broad approach. King's College and the Center have been extraordinarily fortunate to have had Roddy Beaton as Curry's professor since 1988. As his tenure has showed, the chair requires, above all, vision. A vision broad enough to expand the boundaries and cross them, and to nurture new ideas and new connections. The Byzantium that emerges is not the Byzantium of Yeats, or of Gibbon, or of Cavafy, the reader of Gibbon, on whom Roddy Beaton and David Ricks have both written. Nor is it the Byzantium of Ostrogorsky or Stephen Runciman, or indeed even of Ronald Burroughs and the founders of the Curry's Chair. It is far broader than any of those. Byzantium can be and is still traduced, but it's more necessary than it ever was. Your Eminence, ladies and gentlemen, I'm most honored to be standing in front of you and to be able to address you as the very fortunate Corais Chair designate. My name is Gonda, and I'm from across the small pond from Belgium, and I start the job in September. But the big question is, did England score? It scares me, but rumor has it one to zero. First, I have some big shoes to fill. I'd like to express my warmest congratulations and sincere thanks to Professor Roderick Beaton, who has st steered the Corais chair through 30 years of rich activities and continued successes in its scholarly mission and in fundraising. 
As is well known to you, Professor Beaton is the author of many highly acclaimed books and a wide range of articles. He's headed the Department of Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies for numerous years, and he was elected in 2013 to become a fellow of the British Academy. He also oversaw the department transition to the current Center for Hellenic Studies, which again he served for many committed years. In recognition of Professor Beaton's numerous and ongoing contributions to the Center, to Kings, and to the field, we would like to announce a conference that will be held in his honor. It will take place on December 10 and 11, 2021, and it, it is to coincide with two important birthdays. One of Professor Beaton himself, who, because of his retirement, will look even younger and more arrested by that time. The other, the bicentennial of the outbreak of the Greek, Greek War of Independence. The latter historical occasion, set within the framework of modern Greek nation building, will be a featured topic of this conference, along with other research topics that Professor Beaton has unwaveringly embraced over a brilliant career of teaching, research and service, such as, for instance, Seferis and the Greek modernists, or the literary tradition and reception of the Greek novel. So please, already save the dates of December 10, 11, 2021, and plan to join us, and also the nearly one dozen former supervisees of Professor Beaton who have already committed to be present. I extend my warm thanks also to the colleagues who have held the fort of Hellenic Studies with Professor Beaton, and first and foremost to Professor David Rex, fellow organizer of our conference and also to the members of the Center's International Advisory Board. Tonight, and on so many other occasions, they grace us with their presence and share their deep knowledge. Dame Avril Cameron, Sir Michael Levelin smith Professor Pascalis Kitromelidis, and my very own advisor, Richard Martin. Special thanks goes also to Professor Emerita Judith Herren, who gave me the best and the most enthusiastic education in Byzantine studies that I, as a graduate student in the US, could ever have hoped for. Mr. John Kittmer, former UK ambassador to Athens and current chair of the, of the Anglo-Hellenic League, is to be commended for his proactive, energizing role. He's already been reaching out and he's been navigating us through the waters of fundraising. I thank him also for handing out the Katie Landakis Prize to our deserving student, Harry Tanner. Yesterday I went to the British Museum and I saw the very special exhibit called Charmed Lives on Gika, Craxton and Patrick Lee Fermer, featuring three people who embody that special relationship between England, the UK and Greece. Today I thank all those sponsors and champions of this very special charmed relationship who have supported the Korais chair beginning with Professor Edward Byrne, President and Principal of King's, uh, going on to the many who have shown their unwavering support. I mentioned two catalytic gifts in the fundraising campaign coming from the Levendis Foundation and also the Niarchis Foundation, and then the many families and individuals who have extended support as well. I'm most honored too to speak in the presence of Mrs. Lydia Coniordo, Greek Minister of Culture and Sport. She needs no introduction. Our paths have actually crossed in the fascinating world of modern Greek performances of ancient Greek tragedy, a movement that she has simply come to embody. She has, for one, created, and created is the word, the most amazing electra I have ever seen. But I'm grateful to Mr. Dimitrios Karamitsos Tsiras for taking on the pleasant task to introduce Mrs. Kornjordu more suitably, after a few more words of mine. My husband, Gregory Terzian, has stood by me and I, my academic adventures for the past 25 years. When he first heard of Korai's chair, his response was immediate. You've had a history with this man, Korais. He appears on numerous occasions in your book on Aristophanes on modern Greece. His uh, this is a legacy, the legacy of Korais, who came to defend Aristophanes, even though he was never much interested in productions of Aristophanes for the modern Greek state. He felt Aristophanes actually didn't have the proper decorum or the gravitas. But he was certainly interested in the language and the text of Aristophanes. 
I agree. This is one of the lesser known battles fought by Korais, who had many other good causes to embrace. But Corais felt very strongly that the French thinker Voltaire should not have the last and negative word on his compatriot from the classical age, Aristophanes. What then might Corais, Aristophanes, and myself possibly have in common? Certainly a sense of humor is not one of it. What did we, what do we strive for? Dare I say, dare I promise to you, a commitment to Hellenic studies and a love for teaching in the field, an unending devotion to the language, the literature, and the history of Greece through the centuries, a fascination with theater and the drama of politics, a theater that mirrors the real world, the recognition that the speaker or writer and the audience must and actually uh, must always join in a strong partnership for the sake of ideas, knowledge, and critical thinking. And finally, a sense that we cannot go it alone. For all your support, before, during, and from here onward, I thank you very much. And I thank all of you speakers and audience members, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Good evening. Today is a great day for Greek studies, a celebration for Hellenic culture, and a reaffirmation of the close Greek-British relationship. Firstly, and before I fulfill my task of introducing the closing speaker, let me tell you how privileged I, feel I am to be able to share with you this important occasion, this milestone of our joint efforts to promote modern Greek and Byzantine studies of history, language, and, and literature under the auspices of King's College. The establishment of the Korais Chair in 1918, at the critical moment of the European modern history, and its transformation through several years of serious work as one of the leading centers for Hellenic studies worldwide, is an achievement with far-reaching academic and cultural impact for Hellenism as a whole. In this respect, I would like to praise the work of the chair's widely acknowledged professors and academic staff, and highly among them, Professor Beaton, of course, and also wish to acknowledge and thank the eponymous and anonymous benefactors of the chair, who, through their generous contribution and hard work, have supported the chair's work in the past and secure its equally, I'm sure, brilliant future. I also want to thank King's College through the president for their support in this effort. My main task tonight is also one of great pleasure to introduce the concluding speaker of this event. Our speaker, a distinguished minister representing the Hellenic government to this occasion, who is also widely known as a world class actress and a pedagogue in all frankness, I think I should reverse the order of functions of Mrs. Cognordu, stating the artist first, but it, because in this area she doesn't need any introduction. But I think the fact that she traveled to London for this occasion in her capacity as Minister of Culture is highly significant of the importance that the Greek government has in this occasion. Ms. Lydia Cognordu, studied English literature at the University of Athens. She graduated from the National Theatre Drama School, having also studied music and dance. As an actress, she has in interpreted major roles, both classical and contemporary, in Greece and abroad, collaborating with the National Theatre of Greece and many well-known Greek and international theatres and groups. Mrs. Cognordu was appointed Minister of Culture and Sports in November 2016 and has been restless since in promoting Greek culture in a very convincing way, I must add, because I was with her in negotiations this morning. I'm very happy that she is among us tonight and I would like to ask her to come to the podium. Thank you.
Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express how deeply honored I feel to be here with you today. All you honorable, delight, uh, honorable scholars and guests. I would like to begin by thanking the Corais Chair for the organization of this evening's event to celebrate 100 years of its existence. I would also like to thank the Center for Hellenic Studies at King's College as well as the Anglo-Hellenic League as co-organizers. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart Roderick Beaton for his extraordinary contribution and commitment to the chair. And also I would like to thank the very important donors the Niarchos Foundation and the Levendis Foundation, as well as the rest of the foundations and individuals for their generous support. There could be no better choice for the name of a chair of modern Greek studies outside Greece than the name of Adamandios, Adamandios Koreis. Not only was Koreis one of the founding fathers of the Greek nation, our own equivalent of Thomas Jefferson. He was also an all-round intellectual who combined knowledge with liberty. For mankind, this, for the state, for societies, Koreis provided the model for struggle dedicated to a cause. And this cause he served in his own way. Without philosophy, he used to say, no human action is capable of leading to a good outcome. He himself attached great sig significance not to philosophy and knowledge as abstract notions, but to philosophy as a practical condition allied to moral freedom, to justice, and to scientific knowledge. The 16 volumes that he published under the title Hellenic Library, as well as the rest of his writings and the correspondence of this passionate lover of liberty, as he described himself, must be seen from that perspective. His goal was the cultural preparation of the Greeks in mind and soul, and at the same time to overturn dominant European attitudes towards Greece, such as that the Greeks had become sunk in darkness and that there was no reason for them to be liberated. The way he set about achieving this goal was by contributing in practical ways to carry back to Greece the torch represented by the values and the spirit of ancient Greece as these had developed in Europe. The result of this transfusion, he himself used the Greek word metakenosis to describe it, was for the Greeks to acquire, to acquire the culture that would enable them to forge their own way. With the aid, to their own way, I'm sorry, in culture, in Europe, and in history. Adamandius Koreis was not only a father and a teacher of the nation, he was the one who linked the Greek state with European developments in politics, in thought, and in intellectual life, and at the same time, the one who had the vision of a people as the protagonist and master of its own destiny. The Greek Revolution achieved precisely that, finally identifying identity with independence. During subsequent decades, this awakening would continue, and no one would continue the vision of independence more consistently than Eleftherius Venizelos. It was no accident that the Korais chair was founded in 1918. 
That year coincided with the end of the Great War. This date would find Greece stronger than ever before, precisely because of the choices made by Eleftherios Venizelos. Victor in the two Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 that had preceded it, and standing side by side with the victors in major military successes during the Great War. At this key moment, Greece came before the world anew. She was no longer an oppressed nation in the shadow of history, nor a young state still having difficulty in finding its feet, but a new regional power with her own identity and her own horizons. This was the moment when the great power of that time, the British Empire, sought the acquaintance of modern Greece. And surely, there could be no better way to achieve that than through the establishment of the Korais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature. One of the first university positions in the whole world dedicated to the study of contemporary Greece. Following initiatives by the Anglo-Hellenic League and Principal Ronald Burroughs of King's College and donations from the Greek community, the chair was now a reality. Its first holder was one of the most important historians of the period, as was said before, Arnold Toynbee. From that time on, the chair expanded and achieved many things. Distinguished scholars have held the, help, held the chair since Toynbee, the Library of King's Col College London, the Morn Library, today contains one of the largest collections of books and periodicals worldwide dedicated to Greece, while a whole academic department grew up around the chair the Department of Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, now incorporated in the Department of Classics, which in this way includes the study of the whole Hellenic world down to today. For us, Greek citizen, chairs of modern Greek studies outside Greece represent an exceptionally important meeting point, not only for their educational work, Neo-Hellenists represent a passport for our cultural diplomacy abroad, one of the major channels of two-way communication for today's cultural processes. As you know, alongside the ministries which share responsibility for supporting modern Greek studies abroad, we have the section for literature and books, which belongs to the Ministry of Culture and Sport. Our dialogue with the Neo-Hellenists neo needs also to have a practical character. Indicatively, I refer to two recent cases of the placement of four Neo-Hellenists on the Translation Committee of the Ministry of Culture. Dear friends, the world is at a fragile, challenging moment, demanding our collective awareness and acute consciousness. We need to leave behind all the burdens and prejudices of the past, heal all the lingering traumas, and together form the new world we wish to inhabit, transcending the conflicts. We all recognize many challenges that these times impose, not just in Greece, but also throughout the world. However, today, Modern Greek studies are not a luxury. They are a necessity and need to be recognized as such. And at this point, I would like to say how delighted I am that recently, and thanks to the efforts of foundations, institutions, and individuals of the Greek community, sufficient funding has been secured to ensure a long future for the Korais chair. Modern Greek culture is a composite convention it is not simply the continuation of ancient Greek culture in a direct line, but neither can it be seen without it. Each generation comes into contact with its own version of the ancient past, measures itself against it, and interpret, interprets it in its own way, 
and so passes on to later generations, not a sterile past, but a living relationship. And perhaps, finally, James Joyce was right when he taught himself modern Greek while writing his novel Ulysses, declaring that the Greeks of today represent an opening into the ancient past. Modern Greek language, like other historic languages of the world, is a precious proof of the power of live language to resist, defy, absorb, and finally gloriously overcome all the adventures and traumas in its history. We Greek people believe in our modern Greek culture in its potential and its outward looking nature. We believe in this permanent present moment that is creativity, a present moment that looks simultaneously as much to the future as to the past. During the last few years, the years of crisis, Greece has given the first indications of a creative spring. From theater and poetry to cinema and street art. Not only from Greek creators, but also from other, creators from other countries who come to work in Greece. Already all these examples are finding their place at festivals, in editions, in scholar, scholarly works and publications abroad, and in this way creating the two-way dialogue that I described before. Before us, we can see the birth of a new convention, and I call on you to come together and embrace it with me. In this new generation that is creating the most substantive relationship between our countries, it is this generation. I think of the large number of Greeks who have studied at British universities during recent decades, transferring from one country to the other elements of culture, knowledge, and experience more than ever before. So there exists very fertile ground for cultural relations between Greece and Great Britain to become even stronger. I believe that the exit of the UK from the European Union will not hold us back from this. It was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Theresa May herself, who said in her speech on the 12th priorities of the Brexit negotiation, our vote to leave the European Union was no rejection of the values we share. The decision to leave the European Union represents no desire to become more distant to you, our friends and neighbors. So we still regard Europe as a cultural idea, as our shared home, a place where we share the same aspirations and the same values, values as democracy, culture, and dialogue. In the current worldwide crisis, at the time of many disruptions and of even more challenges to economic, political, social, and ecological systems and values, including the refugee crisis, it is vitally necessary to take stock as to redefine the directions and priorities of our politics in relation to culture. This questioning is going on not only in Europe, but also on a broader international level. It concerns the role of culture as compass in shaping the political choices of tomorrow. And only together, through substantive dialogue and the dialectical relationship of things, can we look to the future with optimism. And institutions such as the Korais Chair serve this dialogue in the most profound and the most intrinsic way. Thank you. Uh, Your Eminence, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've had a fantastic uh, discussion over the last hour and a half or thereabouts. 
uh, as part of the celebration for this incredibly important centenary anniversary uh, for all who are interested, not only uh, in the UK but around the world, uh, in Hellenic studies and the studies of Greece. Uh, there could not have been a more appropriate way to end the formal part of the evening than with those wonderful remarks from the Minister uh, who embodies in herself uh, and in her vision uh, much of what is great about Greece. Uh, her optimism for the future uh, is both appropriate and amazing. Please let's thank her again. Thank you.